I grew up in a small town. The sort of place where bad things aren't supposed to happen. That's what we like to tell ourselves anyways. But something terrible did happen. Something I don't ever talk about. That I haven't shared with anyone since it occurred. Hollow's End has old roots. Lots of folklore and history surround this place. Ruins of old structures, churches and government buildings, and other ancient things lost to time dot the sprawling, forested landscape of our town. As children, grown-ups would occasionally tell us tales detailing the origins of these ruins. The stories were often steeped in magic, detailing horrifying events that didn't add up. Creatures coming from the wilderness at night. Trials of a witch woman who would kidnap children and farmhands who were never again seen. It wasn't until later on in life that I realized most towns didn't have those types of stories. Those recollections were quite unique to our town. But still, as a kid, my favorite stories were always the scariest. The one about a sanctuary deep within the local forest caught the interest of everyone my age when we had heard about it. Temple of Doom had recently come out when we learned about the place from a speaker at school during a local history class. Most of us had never heard the story, and word spread like wildfire about the mysterious ruins in the forest that could no longer be found. Sinister things had happened there according to the friendly looking, bespeckled man who stood speaking in front of our class. A coven or a guild of some kind practiced their dark arts in that place kept rituals and ceremonies that were hidden from the public eye. People had gone missing from the nearby village and a couple hundred years ago, a slew of questions began to arise about what exactly was happening at this temple of evil, which existed deep within the forest. The local townspeople had raided the sanctuary, invaded the dark temple, and put the inhabitants of the place to death in the most horrifying ways imaginable. Only the eldest and wisest among them, their leader, had escaped. Their identity was never known to the public. Ever since that day, the town had been cursed. At least according to that legend. This patch of forest where the ancient sanctuary had once stood was close to my house. And despite the terrifying stories, we would frequently play in those woods when I was a kid. My parents would warn us about playing in the forest after dark, saying never to stay past sunset. But during the daytime, we were free to explore. It was a wide stretch of woodland that seemed to go on forever, at least to our young eyes, and we managed to find new things within it every day. We built forts in the fallen trees and rode our bikes down these steep hills that lined the gullies and valleys within. We would sword fight each other with fallen branches, play with matches, and occasionally light fireworks. Essentially, all the dumb activities kids of that age do when left alone in the woods. It was our getaway, our own private, natural playground that extended for acres and acres. We rarely saw anyone else out there. One summer day, I was walking through to my friends, Brad and Tom and we came across another kid who looked vaguely familiar from around town, but who I didn't know very well. He was walking along in the forest and looked kind of sad all by himself. Hey man, I said, trying to sound friendly. You okay? When he looked up, I could see that he had been crying and I felt even worse for him. Sorry, he said sniffling, wiping his nose with his sleeve and getting stretchy lengths of snot all over it. I... this is so dumb. I moved here a while ago and I still don't know anybody. All my friends live a thousand miles away and I'm stuck here by myself. I put my hand on his shoulder reassuringly and asked him his name. Ned, he told me, wiping his eyes. Hey Ned, I'm Jordan and this is Brad and Tom. We can be your friends, how about that? Simple enough, right? I looked over and Brad and Tom weren't objecting. I could tell that they felt bad for the kid too. Uh, for real? Yeah man, no worries. Well, what were you guys doing? 
you mind if I tag along? We told him that we had planned to go look for the lost ruins of the ancient temple in the forest. It was early on a Saturday morning and we had the whole day ahead of us, but we had no idea where to start looking, only knowing that it was somewhere within the woods where we were. Well, actually, I might be able to help, said Ned. My mom is a history nerd and I asked her about it after school yesterday. She told me it was to the west, probably over that hill I would say. Wow, thanks dude. It's a good thing you're here. You can be our navigator, okay? We set off enthusiastically, our pace quick, almost running at first. But then our legs grew tired and we began to slow our pace. After walking for an hour or more, the four of us decided to take a rest. We had come across a thickly overgrown section of the brush and wanted to stop for a while before going any deeper. I was starting to get tired of walking and was considering saying that we should stop for the day, when Ned spoke up. Do you guys see that? It's like a reflection. I turned and saw the glint in the distance immediately. What is that? Brad asked. I have no idea. We got up and started walking through the dense shrubbery towards the reflection. It was so dark in the trees that it was hard to see. Difficult to move in the thick overgrowth, but we pushed through. The branches seemed to grab at my clothing and I had to fight hard against them to get past. There were thorn bushes which tore my skin, and the barbs went into my face like fish hooks, refusing to come out nicely. I twisted and turned my head to try and get the thorns out of my skin, my hands trapped at my sides. Eventually, I managed to free myself, ripping and tearing my face and arms to bloody shreds in the process. I looked around and saw that I was scratched and red with blood, but I managed to get out of the thorns and thistles and I pushed through, finally coming out into an opening. Tom and Brad made their way out of the forest next and stumbled out looking even more worse for wear than I did, bloodied and scratched by the thorns. They were trembling and out of breath, panting with exertion. Wow, that was pretty gnarly. Yeah, no kidding. Ned came through next, his skinny body twisting and angling itself to come through the thorn bushes without much visible damage, only a few cuts. He fixed his glasses and combed back his hair with his hands and joined us in the clearing. I looked up and saw what had been reflecting the light at us through the trees. It was the window of an old house. The place wasn't a simple cottage or a shack in the woods either. It was a house. Run down and ugly looking. The roof sagging down at the middle but a house nonetheless. And the siding had been painted red at some point in the past, I guessed. But had taken on a dusty, dingy brown shade after years of neglect. Several of the windows were broken, but others remained intact. Shutters were hanging loose and askew, and the whole place had a haunted, lonely vibe to it that I didn't like very much. Whoa, there's a house out there? Who the heck builds a house in the middle of the forest? I couldn't answer that question, but guessed that it was someone who really wanted to be left alone. Shivers ran down my spine thinking about that, and I began to feel more and more afraid. It would take a very committed hermit to craft a retreat like this. The place was as secluded as it gets. Guys, maybe we should go. You never know, there could still be someone living in there. The three of us stared at the entrance and I noticed the door was ajar. It was hanging open invitingly, swaying in the breeze as if it were waving and beckoning us to come in. Nobody lives here, dude. It's abandoned. Just look at it. Brad started walking the short distance towards the house, and I felt a queasiness brewing in the pit of my stomach as I followed after him. When we got to the doorway, Brad hesitated, but only for a second, before stepping inside the echoing, empty building. Tom went in next, and then Ned, and I followed hesitantly after, feeling more afraid of being left alone than going inside at that point. The wooden floors creaked and squeaked beneath our feet as we went into the dark, dusty old house. It was quiet inside except for the echoing sounds of our footsteps. Empty aside from a few things, an old cast iron frying pan which was rusted and covered in dust, and spiderwebs had been left on the floor. 
We went deeper into the dark, dilapidated old house to find a living area on the main floor. An old newspaper was scattered on the rug, parts of it laying open on a busted, hole-covered couch, as if someone had just been reading it, but the yellowed paper looked decades old. There were a few other pieces of ancient, broken furniture, haphazardly tipped over on their sides. A filthy, broken mirror, but nothing that suggested anyone might actually still live there. I turned around and jumped, startled at the sight of someone standing in one of the dark corners of the room watching us. A person dressed entirely in black, their pale, wrinkled face only barely visible in the shadows. I screamed, pointing at the corner where the thing stood watching, but then realized it was only an old coat stand with a wrinkled white hat on it. Brad, Ned, and Tom had a good laugh at that one. When we started backtracking towards the main entrance and saw that there were a couple of closed doors off the main hallway. The first one was located next to the front door. Brad, the daredevil that he was, decided he would open it. I watched as he twisted the knob slowly and carefully, opening the door to reveal a small, darkened space. It appeared empty aside from an old broom and some wire hangers. Boring, said Brad. I didn't share his sentiment. This whole place felt off. It was making the hair stand up on the back of my neck and it was making me feel nauseous, cold and sweaty all at the same time. Ned walked over to the other door. He took a deep breath and raised a trembling hand to open it. The darkness was gradually flooded with dim light as he pushed open the wooden door, its rusted hinges squealing. Just an old bathroom said Ned, looking inside. You guys want to go check out the upstairs? Hey, hang on, what's that? Tom asked, eyeing the wall at the far end of the darkened room. We all crowded around to look and saw immediately what he had noticed. A piece of vermilion fabric was showing from beneath the baseboard near the bathtub. What the heck? Brad marched in and pulled on the fabric to pick it up. It stuck. That was when I noticed the long, rounded black marks on the floor. Um, guys, I think this wall might not actually be a wall. They all looked at me and followed my gaze down to the marks on the floor, barely visible in the darkness. Whoa, okay, now things are getting creepy. Is this a secret passage or something? Only one way to find out. Come on, let's try to get it open. We spent the next few minutes pulling on various fixtures and getting grossed out when cockroaches and mice would occasionally scamper and skitter around us and on us, but eventually someone figured it out. It must have been Ned. He pulled on the chain which was connected to the plug in the bathroom sink, and surprisingly, a sound began like gears ticking. The entire wall began to swing in towards us and we had to take a step back to let it open. The well-hidden, secret doorway revealed an ancient-looking set of stairs, which went downwards for a long, long ways. The small amount of light quickly dissipated, and nothing could be seen below in that horrifying pit of darkness. Immediately, I lost any courage that I had left. This was beyond anything we were prepared for, but we had found what we were looking for. We were almost immediately sure of that. Hidden beneath this well-camouflaged house in the woods, existing against all common sense, were these subterranean ruins of the ancient sanctuary that we had learned about in history class. Check out those carvings on the walls, exclaimed Ned, remain behind us in these small space. We moved forward and saw that there were indeed carvings, elaborate reliefs and images hewn from the stone adorning the passageway leading downwards. The three of us crowded around the doorway, scared and excited, looking at the carvings. They showed terrible images, and I wondered immediately why anyone would want to make art depicting such bad things, such darkness. I guess my grandpa was right about the ruins being over in this direction. You guys want to go down and check it out? A tinkling sensation was covering my entire body, goosebumps rising on my skin. Something about his voice wasn't quite right, and hadn't he said that it was his mom who was the history nerd? 
She was the only one who had told him in which direction the temple ruins lay. Or was I mistaken? I, I thought it was your mom who said it was here. Uh, whoops. I heard Ned mutter quietly to himself. I got my stories mixed up. Ah, well, it doesn't matter. Suddenly, I felt him push me from behind with such force that I went stumbling forward into Brad and Tom. I'm off balance and unable to stop myself from falling over the precipice. The three of us tumbled violently and bone-shatteringly downwards into the blackness below, crashing and bouncing against the hard rock and its sharp edges. Eventually, we had reached the floor down below, careening into the wall opposite the stairs with such force that it felt as if my jaw had shattered. My ears were ringing and I immediately had an awful headache that pierced my brain like a spike through the temple. I was barely conscious and in such horrible agony that I barely registered the demented laughter coming from up above for a few long moments. Of course it was Ned. It had been him from the beginning. He had led us to this dark temple in the forest, just like the terrifying stories that we had heard in history class. I heard the murmur of echoing voices and footsteps approaching in the dark, and my heart began to pound with fear like never before. What had we gotten ourselves into? Have you ever trusted someone and gotten burned? Helped someone and had your kindness repaid with suffering? Well, then you can relate to how I was feeling when I woke up in the blackness beneath the abandoned house in the woods. The rough stone floor was cold beneath me, and I struggled to focus, my aching head swimming in the darkness. Had I lost consciousness for a brief second? Yes, it seemed as if I had. We were in a house, I remember that, but this wasn't a house. It was a terrible, dark, cavernous dungeon sort of place that I didn't like at all. Not one bit. And the sound of footsteps drawing near made my heart jackhammer with fear, knowing immediately that they did not belong to someone friendly. There had been an abandoned house in the woods. We had gone inside, me, Brad, and Tom. Except there had been someone else with us. Ned. It all came flooding back to me in an instant, and with it came the pounding, incessant pain in my temples. I tried getting to my feet and fell backwards off balance. The footsteps were getting closer. I started to shake Brad and Tom, whispering to them, Get up, get up. Someone's coming. Tom grunted and looked like he was maybe going to wake up, but Brad just lay there looking pale and cold. He didn't make a sound his breathing shallow and barely noticeable. The flame of a torch was getting closer, turning from a firefly into a candle wick in size, and I instinctively hid. I ran to the first concealed place that I could find, beneath these stone stairs just a few yards away, managing to wedge myself into the tight space, just before the approaching men were within range to see me. Looks like Nettie screwed up again said one of the men laughing. He kicked Tom with his shoe, and he groaned and blinked his eyes graggily, seeming not to understand what was happening. Nah, you'll get it one of these days. Give him a break, he's still a kid. Just get him upstairs to the pitfall. That's all he's got to do. Pull the dang lever when they're all in the bedroom, and he won't have to have these sorts of problems. He kicked Tom harder again. That's why we built the dang thing. Wouldn't have bothered if he was just going to keep shoving them down the stairs. Yep, at least this one's knocked out cold. There were three of them, all dressed in long, hooded, vermilion robes. The same color as the scrap of fabric we had found beneath the hidden door in the bathroom. It was all starting to come together as I overheard them talking. Ned was the one who lured kids out into the forest to find the abandoned house. They were making people disappear in this place just like the stories we had heard about in history class. But we weren't supposed to see the hidden door in the bathroom, I surmised. The last thing he had said before we noticed the scrap of fabric and the scuff marks on the floor, indicating the secret passage was there, was that we should go check out the upstairs. So the real trap door, whatever it was, that dropped people down into this dungeon was actually up there, which meant the door we had come through had not been used for its intended purpose was that maybe the way these evil people got in and out of here. And if it was, 
Maybe there was a latcher lover that would let me out. And perhaps there was hope for me after all. But I couldn't just leave my friends. As scared as I was, I needed to see what was going to happen to them. And if I could still save them. Besides, Ned was still up in the house for all I knew. He hadn't followed us and so had perhaps taken some other route down into the dungeon. There was also still the chance that he was up there waiting for us to try and escape. I couldn't take the chance. The terrible headache was making it difficult to think. I couldn't focus and only knew that I wanted to try and help my friends as terrified as I was. So when the three men picked up my friends and started to carry them away, I followed after at a distance. I felt as if I was unsafe no matter what I did. So my panicked mind instinctively wanted to stay with my friends and with the light. That's all I can say to justify it in retrospect. I wish I had just run and taken my chances up in the house against Ned though. I will never be able to unsee the things that happened after that. I followed the men dragging my friends away, quickly realizing I would have to keep track of each turn as the maze-like subterranean tunnel seemed to go on forever. To help myself get back, I left a penny from my pocket at each left or right, heads for left, tails for right. This place was ancient by the looks of it and more elaborate than anyone could have imagined. There were hieroglyphics and murals, symbols and colorful imagery painted on the walls, but it could barely be glimpsed in the darkness. I got the impression that there was once a great society living beneath the ground here, unknown and unmentioned in the history books. The torchlight flickered and dissipated up ahead, and I had to pick up the pace to keep up with the men, terrified of being left alone in the dark maze where I would no doubt roam lost forever. I realized when I heard Tom waking up and screaming that they were hurrying their pace because he was fighting and struggling with them. Suddenly, they turned a corner, and they were gone. I caught up and looked around the sharp rock wall to see a vast open chamber. There was a throne in a dais which was ornate and covered in dark purple and black jewels. Candlelit chandeliers hung suspended from the ceiling, and the huge room echoed within the movements of the hooded men. There was someone sitting upon the throne, dressed in a long hooded vermilion robe. Their faces were shrouded in darkness and they sat waiting, looking impatient. Two smaller thrones were set up on either side of this person, who I assumed was the leader of their group. You have done well once again. What have you brought us this time, servants of the many-legged god? Came a feminine voice from the center throne. Two young spirits, mother of mothers, we bring them to you so that you may mold them to your purposes, to the purpose of the Dark Temple. May they bring you many years of servitude, and may their spirits and wills be easily broken. The hooded woman on the throne in the center raised her long hand up, and summoned the men to come forward. They did, appearing cautious and afraid. Closer. They went closer. The mother of mothers, as the man had called her, did not seem pleased after all. She reached out and grabbed the man by the throat and the other two backed away, trembling. How exactly am I supposed to make a life-bonded servant of a dead boy? My heart stopped in my chest for a moment, hearing that. Brad had looked pale and his breathing had been shallow after the fall down the stairs. Maybe now it had stopped entirely. He had looked pretty rough after all. She continued to strangle the man with one strong hand, and I realized suddenly how tall she was. She towered over the men when she stood up, probably over seven feet. She released her grip for a few moments to let him speak. I'm sorry, mother. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. It was Ned. That boy is obstinate, but I will teach him. I will teach him to be better, I swear. I will make him understand. You peddle in excuses and lies, Simon. Take note for your next life. This is far less than the many-legged god deserves. The man began to scream in shrill cries of terror as he realized he was not going to get his way. She was done with him. No, we have been patient enough with you. You were told long ago to take responsibility for your charges. You have forsaken that responsibility. No, please, please, give me another chance. Don't do this. The woman was still holding him by the throat, 
tilting her head as she examined him. The man thrashed and barked, trying to get away from her. The woman began to emit a low and melodious clicking sound. When the movie Predator came out a few years later, I remember jumping when I heard the sound the creature in that movie made because it was so similar. The other two women who had been seated in their thrones upon the dais began to emit this low clicking groan as well. The sound grew louder and louder as the ground seemed to rumble and shake beneath my feet. I noticed then how the ornately carved stone walls had a large sewer grate sized holes in them, cleanly hollowed out and dark inside. From a few of these black holes came these shapes of creatures unlike anything I had seen before. They were huge, colorless millipedes with mouths full of sharp teeth. Their eyes glowed a pale blue shade, brimming with keen intelligence, but moreover, hunger. These creatures seemed to sniff the air and came down in weaving serpentine motions towards the man, still thrashing and screaming as the hooded woman held him by the neck. Their many legs skittered and clawed at the air. Tom was also fully awake now I could see. He was being held by the remaining two men and was fighting hard against them to get away. Seeing the unnatural creatures that were lurking in this dark underground temple of despair. More and more of the giant and millipede creatures were emerging from their holes. And they lunged at the hooded man and began to strike him in bloodthirsty attacks. Swarming him like a hive of snakes. Crimson fluid sprayed from his neck as they tore off his head and fought over it like hyenas, nipping and snapping at each other to gain the choicest morsels. All courage vanished from me as I saw this bewildering and terrifying scene occur before my eyes. Even at a distance, the worst of things obscured by darkness. I will never forget the things that I saw. I will have nightmares about them forever, especially knowing those carnivorous creatures still reside down there beneath my feet in the bowels of the town. Once the shed was over, the massive millipedes retreated back into their respective holes and I saw that Tom had been knocked unconscious by one of the two remaining men. He was a goner, I realized. There was no way that I could save him by myself. My best bet was to retreat and take my chances against Ned up in the house. I could try to get the authorities to come back and help, if anyone believed me. I turned around and saw Ned was standing just behind me, an unlit torch held in his hands which he looked about to swing at my head. Startled, I jumped back just as he had lunged at me swinging the torch. Luckily he missed and wound up stumbling forward off balance. Since I was larger than him, I managed to use his momentum against him and pushed him while spinning out of the way. It was probably the best thing that could have possibly happened, I guess, since I had caught him off guard by turning around just as he was fully committed to taking a swing at me. Ned missed completely and flew past me to wind up sprawled on the floor. I began to run immediately, knowing what was going to happen next. Surely enough, Ned began to scream for the other men to come and help, yelling, Dad, he's getting away. As I ran, I heard the clicking, groaning, rumbling sound begin from the hooded woman once again. The walls all around me began to shake, as I raced back through the underground tunnels towards the staircase. I just hoped that I was right and it was the way out. The entire tunnel was rumbling and quaking all around me, making me lose my balance and stumble as I ran. Behind me, I could hear the voices of my pursuers and could see the flickering light from their torches. At first, I had a very strong feeling that I was not going to make it far, but it turned out that I had the upper hand in the darkness especially since I had marked my path earlier. It was easy enough to remember the first turn, so when I saw the pennies on the ground in the dim light, I knew which way to go instinctively. This threw off my pursuers and it gave me hope. I realized they could not see me in the darkness once I was far enough away. They proudly assumed that I would get lost in the tunnels and that I had no idea where I was going. Little did they know that I was headed straight back towards the exit. They slowed down behind me in the labyrinthine tunnels, and eventually their voices faded into the distance. I made it back to the stairs and I climbed up these steep, crumbling steps. At the top, I saw the secret door leading to the bathroom in the abandoned house where we had come in. There was a chain on the other side that we had pulled to get in, 
tended to look like a sink plug. I searched for a similar mechanism on this side. On the left, I eventually found it. Pulling on it, I heard the door begin to slide open. And then voices were coming from behind me again. And the clicking sound like a thousand legs on stone. Insectile but louder. And looking down the stairs over my shoulder with a hurried glance, I saw the man from our history class who had told us about the Dark Temple. He was one of them, perhaps Ned's dad. Everything had been orchestrated to get us out here, to trap us down here. This place was an unholy sanctuary to some ancient and terrible god, subterranean and evil, the many-legged god. The people who lived down here had their own system, their own world, and I wanted no part of it. They needed a fresh offering though, and they were intent on keeping their secret. The bespeckled man raced up these steps towards me, not yet seeing what was coming out of these stonework on either side of my head. I saw the holes bore out of the stone walls on either side of me, the size of sewer grates. As the door slowly opened, I saw the creatures emerge from their burrows closing in on me, their antenna twitching and mandibles clicking as they sniffed the air. The man reached me without seeing the creatures emerging from the shadows. He lunged at me and I ducked just as he did so. All I heard was screaming as the creatures attacked him, too hungry to pass up a meal. His red spraying the walls of my face with warm, crimson fluid. As the huge millipedes attacked the hooded man, I moved as quickly as I could out through the open door and ran. Ned's screams mixed with his father's as I emerged in the bathroom of the abandoned house in the woods. I pulled the chain quickly, causing the secret door to slam shut behind me, closing off the madness that it concealed. The wailing cries of pain and terror shut off abruptly as it closed, and it left me with the sound of my own horrified heartbeats pounding in my ears. The light of the sun blinded me when I left the house. It had been so dark down in the tunnels, but my eyes adjusted and I made my way through the painful thorny thicket and I ran back home. As quickly as my legs could carry me, I ran, terrified of every sound I heard in the forest, scared of every squirrel that rustled in the leaves, and every bird that chirped in the trees, thinking each one of them might be a millipede burrowing its way up from the underground to chase after me. No wonder my parents had said to stay out of the forest after dark. This thought should have clued me into what happened next. I should have realized that my parents knew more than what they were saying, right from the beginning. I got home panting and out of breath and begged my mom and dad to call the police. I began to tell them what had happened to Tom and Brad, and they stopped me and just shook their heads. You're getting bolder again, said my father, his eyes thoughtful, staring far off into the distance. I told you we were past time for another cleansing, said my mother. They began making phone calls and stuffing rags into old liquor bottles. I assumed to make Molotov cocktails. Guns were suddenly being loaded and arranged on the table in an organized fashion and grenades were being set beside them. I didn't even think my parents owned one gun, let alone this arsenal of warfare. I had never realized my parents were so awesome. It'll be dark soon, we need to get moving son, said my mom, strapping on a Kevlar vest. Now, where did you say that abandoned house was?